All right, if you're watching this video, this is the video lecture on igneous uh, volcanoes, which at this point, you've already taken the igneous notes, you've already done the igneous volcano book assignment, you've even done the igneous lab where you had those nine rocks that you had to place into that grid, um, as you saw in the tutorial video to kind of support you. So this is going to be on a brand new page of notes, page 19 in your notebook, um, and the title for it is Volcanoes. And our learning target is, is what are the different types of volcanoes and an example of each. So let's make sure we focus on the different types. We'll obviously get into the types of magma that make these kind of volcanoes. And of course, an example of each. So as we look at these three pictures up above here, we can actually see three very distinct different looking volcanoes. One that has a bunch of gray material coming out of it, which we call these gray eruptions. And then we have one that has lava coming out of it, which is pretty unique. Of course, I'd love to see something like that in my lifetime. And then the third kind of volcano that we have shown here is one that is showing another gray eruption. But later in the month of this particular eruption, there's also lava flow. So this is the one that's kind of a mix of the two. And we'll go through each one very carefully today. Now, the very first thing you see here in this slide is just kind of a map of the world showing us where a majority of the volcanoes are. And one of the obvious things that students typically notice right off the bat is that there is a region on the earth where we have a majority of our volcanoes. It also happens to be where a majority of the earthquakes are too. I'm gonna give you three seconds to try to answer what is the name of this place. I bet 100% of you would know. So here we go, one, two, three. This place is called the Ring of Fire. So if that's what you said, good job. So going on to our very first volcano type called Shield Volcano, and we will be drawing a little side view picture of what a shield volcano looks like. Our textbook does a pretty good job of showing you a graphic of what they would look like uh, if we were to draw one, but hang tight here, we'll come back to this. Some things to point out in this picture here as you look at this uh, volcanic fountain shooting out magma out of the earth um, surface onto the surface itself, producing lava. But you'll notice in this picture here that we got lava itself churning into these little black rocks. Now, believe it or not, in that little igneous rock lab, you actually got to see this rock. This is a rock called scoria. And it looks like it's been scorched when you actually hold it in your hand, which is a really easy way to remember the name of that rock. But also on here, we get to see on the sides here, as this lava flows in its direction, eventually it's going to cool off and turn into basalt which is another one of the black rocks that we got to see in our igneous rock lab. It's one of the two black ones that you guys got to see. Now, that brings us down to our information here. So some things about shield volcanoes is that they're very flat. They have a kind of a cone type shape, like all volcanoes, but more of a shield looking, uh, like a warrior shield, which is where the name actually comes from. So if I were to draw this, I would just draw a flat line. So this is where you could be standing. And deep within the earth, we have some magma chambers. And those magma chambers are working their way to the surface. They're, and the reason they work their way to the surface is because they are warm and things that are less dense than the surrounding rock are going to rise. Just like a hot air balloon that you might go on a ride for someday. That hot air rises because it's more uh, buoyant than the surrounding area. In other words, it's less dense. Now, over millions of years, what's going to happen is lava is going to be pouring out of this magma chamber onto the surface. And eventually, of course, we get a very flat, broad-shaped volcano. And like I said, sometimes you get some spectacular fountains on the very, very top. Now, down below here are some pictures in Hawaii of two famous uh, volcanoes, one known as Mauna Kea, and the other one we'll see here in a second called Mauna Loa. But from a side view, and we're pretty far away from this peak, from a side view, you can see this big, flat, broad shape there, which is why it gets that name Shield Volcano. It looks like a warrior shield. Now, the unique thing about Shield Volcanoes is that they do produce lava. They do not produce uh, gray eruptions, which are the ones with big, giant clouds that shoot um, atmospheric rock into the atmosphere uh, that would block out sunlight and stuff like that. That would not happen here on this type of volcano. Uh, and the reason is, is because of the type of magma it is. Um, the type of magma that we see with this kind of volcano is very mafic. Um, and I'm not 100% sure if it's written any other place in this presentation, so I'm just going to jot it down here. We have a mafic magma. And remember, mafic magmas produce dark, iron-rich, and magnesium-rich rocks. 
So anyways, let's move along here. We'll look at to see that picture of that other Hawaiian volcano, volcano which is Mauna Loa. Um, what's interesting about volcano research and volcano vocabulary is that a lot of it is um, produced from the Hawaiian language. Um, I forget the root uh, family name of this particular language at the top of my head right now, Polynesian, that's what it is. Uh, so the Polynesian language is kind of where a lot of the Hawaiian uh, words come from. And, um, and when we go through this unit here, you'll see some pretty unusual words, which are all Polynesian root words or Hawaiian type words. So some things I want to point out in this picture here is that, as you can see up here on the top with Mauna Kea, we have a much younger lava flow, very few plants forming here. The rock hasn't even rusted yet, even though it's rich in iron. Um, but down below uh, at Mauna Loa, which could be a couple hundred thousand years older, the rock has really started to change and produce almost like a soil. We got a lot of cactus forming in this high altitude environment. It looks like it must be pretty dry here. But yet we have some grasses that are forming as well. I'm guessing this photograph was taken in the fall or the spring or the winter when there's just not a lot of vegetation growing. But you can see a pretty drastic difference from top to bottom and how as you let a volcano age, it produces dirt or soil. Kind of a neat picture of some volcanic lava. Um, and that kind of brings us into our next piece here, which is the two mafic lava types. Now, one of these words here is kind of a tough one to pronounce, pohoi hoi. Um, and this is a lava that has what we call a low viscosity. A viscosity is probably going to be a new term for you, but viscosity is a term that describes the resistance to flow. And so pohoi hoi has a low resistance to flow. So as a result, the lava moves fast as it flows downhill. And of course, I could just take some markers here, or little pens here, and show which way this is all flowing. And just like water flows downhill, lava is going to flow downhill as well. Uh, water is the ultimate of low viscosity. Uh, but magma has, um, when we look at the types of magma that flow, um, mafic lavas specifically, low viscosity ones, we just call pohoi hoi, which is uh, another Hawaiian word. And then down below here, we get to see the other type of lava, which is called uh, ah ah. Now, ah ah right there, kind of a silly word I know, and it's pronounced kind of silly as well, is a type of lava that has a very high viscosity, meaning it's thick. Um, chunky peanut butter would be a good example of a high viscosity. Or how about this, a Dairy Queen blizzard. You know how when you go to Dairy Queen and you get a blizzard, they flip it upside down so they can show you that it's uh, really good ice cream and that it's thick and loaded with all the goodies that you like in there. That's just a high viscosity solution is all it is. Uh, so it doesn't fall out. Um, something like honey would probably be low viscosity. Something like uh, butter uh, when it's cold would be high viscosity. But if you heat it up in a microwave, it becomes low viscosity. And so that tells us a little bit about the temperatures that we would expect to see inside these two types of lavas that there's probably a correlation between temperatures, between low viscosity and high viscosity, which there's some truth to that. Mostly it's chemistry though. Being rich in silica is one that makes magmas and lavas flow really slow. Now here, these are typically videos that I would show in class, and if you were to open up the Google Slides, you can actually click on these links and open them up. I would encourage you to do them so you could actually see video of what it looks like or just go to YouTube and type in these two words and you'll get to see some example videos of what those lava flows look like. Now that brings us to our next type of volcano called the cinder cone. Cinder cones um, are a type of volcano that's not as common, but these are the types of volcanoes that we definitely keep a closer eye on here on Earth because they produce gray eruptions. And this is an example of a gray eruption where we're seeing a cloud of matter thrown into the atmosphere and sometimes this cloud can get as tall as um, 30, 40, 50,000 feet high. And if you're putting ash into the atmosphere, of course it's going to block sunlight. If you block sunlight, you block plant growth. And if you block plant growth, you're stopping animals from having a food source, which of course is a really important part of the food chain, the sun, as we learned in our carbon cycle stuff. Now, the notes here that we have is that what we have is layers of superheated rock. So it's not actually lava that's coming out of here. It's just cooled off lava where it's crystallized and hardened into a, a thick, dense sludge. It's not that it's not hot. It's probably still hot. Uh, it's just not going to have 
uh, high flow characteristics like we saw with mafic volcanoes. Now, mafic volcanoes are pretty unique because they produce just black rocks, uh, dark colored rocks, while cinder cones produce some different colors, lighter uh, grays and stuff like that. Not so much the black stuff. In fact, here we get to see Sunset Crater in Arizona, and you can see that there's lots of rusty colored rocks here um, that uh, are a result of oxidation. These volcanoes have really steep sides, so probably hard to walk up if you were trying to hike and walk up one. But if I were to draw one, of course I would draw a flat surface. So this is where you would be on the surface of the Earth. Apologize for the stick figure there. And let's create a little magma chamber deep in the Earth. And of course that magma is gonna rise to the surface because it's less dense. And what we end up with is some superheated rock piles. And these superheated rock piles as they eject their matter out from that um, pressure-built volcano from the magma chamber, we just accumulate more little bits and pieces and fragments on these walls, uh, these steep-sided walls. If you ever get to see a cinder cone volcano, um, kind of like you see down here in the picture below, uh, in fact, there's several of them in this photograph here, even one sitting right back here, as you can see, with that grayish color which would be a, the, probably the most classic color that you would see. But um, the material that comes out of these volcanoes, if I were to draw some of this stuff here, this stuff is actually called tephra. And we actually get to see that word right here. Um, tephra is just a general term describing rock that comes out of a cinder cone volcano. Could be ash, could be dust sized particles, or could be boulders boulder sized particles of, of rock that has cooled off as it was rising to the surface. Um, not too much tephra found in Minnesota here because it weathers away pretty well, but if we lived back here in Minnesota over a billion years ago when Minnesota was tectonically active, we'd probably have a lot more of that kind of stuff here. So here's just a photograph of some ash coming out, just a little burp more or less it looks like from that volcano. And here we get to see the pyroclastic flow or the damaging part of these kinds of volcanoes. These pyroclastic flows uh, can actually produce some pretty uh, devastating um, results. First of all, the word pyro, most of you have heard that word before, means fire. And the word classic means fragment of other rock. So it's a cloud of fragment of superheated rock. And it will flow downhill just like water does or like lava does. But they can exceed... Uh, 300 mile per hour flows. So if you're this little dude here trying to run away in that direction, you're in big trouble. You're not going to be able to get out of there. If you've ever heard the story of Pompeii in Italy, where Vesuvius is, uh, Vesuvius is one of the world's most famous volcanoes that buried the city of Pompeii. They had a cloud of ash and rock and dust come through their village and bury all the people of the city of Pompeii which is now obviously a very historic place in Italy to visit if you ever get to go to Italy. And then lastly is our composite volcano. Now I gotta say this just so I don't forget, these are also known as strato cones or strato volcanoes as well. Strato actually is a Latin word that means layered. So based on that, you can probably already guess that these kinds of volcanoes have lots of layers. So what we're gonna see layers of is layers of rock and ash, and we're gonna see layers of lava. So here we get to see our information that we write down. We've already talked about the word strato, but we're just gonna see alternating layers of lava and tephra. So in other words, gray eruptions and red eruptions. And they might be weeks apart or days apart. You're probably not gonna see the eruptions happening at the same time for lava and tephra type eruptions, but def definitely over geologic history, you'll see an accumulation of different types of flows. Now this volcano that you're seeing up above here is actually in Seattle, Washington. It's called Mount Rainier. And this is a volcano that has built up over time. It's over 14,000 feet now of just layers of lava and uh, tephra rock. And here you can see some lava flows shown on this picture here. Um, kind of in this region right here, here's one, and it looks like here's one as well. But maybe when these lava eruptions are done, we get some pyroclastic layers and some tephra type stuff that builds up this volcano. Um, but it's just a combination of shield volcanoes and cinder cones is all it is. Kind of like with uh, our magma types, we did have a rock type that's kind of a mixture of the two together, two types of lava put together. So remember there was mafic, 
there's falsic. This one is andesitic magma. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, most of you have heard of this volcano before, Mount St. Helens. Uh, your parents were alive when this little bugger erupted. It's Mount St. Helens is in Washington as well. If you've ever flown into Washington, you may have seen it. Uh, off in the distance, right next to Mount Rainier, which is that picture up above there that we were looking at earlier. And what's fascinating about this eruption is that it is the most studied eruption in, in human history, really, because it's a modern gray eruption with multiple lava flows that took place afterwards. Now, as you can see here, we have the volcano sitting here on the very top here. And uh, geologists or volcanologists knew it was becoming active as a bulge was starting to form on the north side of the volcano. And as magma rose to the surface, you can start to see that bulge there. And the volcano would gas and degas and throw a little bit of ash and dust into the atmosphere in late April. But eventually we get to the point where this eruption took place, which was on May 18th, 1980. And there's a video at the end of this uh, slide presentation that if you wanted to open up the slides, power or Google slide show and click on it, you could actually see a little documentary on that particular eruption. It's pretty cool stuff. But here you can see that there was a lateral blast. Instead of the volcano erupting straight up like you would imagine, it actually produced a big landslide and the volcano erupted sideways. And eventually when that vent was cleared and opened up and the magma chamber had a clear route to let that uh, ash and dust into the atmosphere, it most certainly did. This cloud, I, from what I understand, exceeded 40,000 feet in altitude. That is higher than most airplanes fly. When you fly a commercial airline, that's pretty darn high. And airplanes cannot fly through these things, uh, these clouds of, of rock and, and uh, glass, more or less, in the atmosphere. It's very dangerous. But uh, kind of a neat uh, before and after. This is Mount Rainier in the background here. Let's get my laser pointer here. So there's Mount Rainier. This is Mount St. Helens. And as I scroll down here, take a look at the difference. Look what happened to this volcano. So there used to be a peak here, and you can see this is the direction of north. That's where that bulge was, and all of that landslide took its way in that direction. And, of course, the atmosphere uh, portion of it as well was devastating for this uh, area. Not only um, probably economically, I would imagine, but there was some human life lost. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 57 people, I think, died total. Um, and then, of course, all the animal and ecology that was damaged in this area. Um, I got to travel to this place when I was uh, maybe a, a young college student. Um, went out to Mount St. Helens National Observatory and got to see stuff that looks just like this. You know, it's been over 40 years now since it erupted this coming May. And there are now 40-year-old trees there. Um, so... Uh, trees do a pretty good job of kind of hiding the, the surface of the things that have happened in the past. Um, so if uh, you've gotten this far, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, definitely go to the Google Slides presentation and click on this last picture here. It'll open up a short documentary on the eruption and you'll actually get to see some real footage of what it looked like when that landslide took place and the eruption occurred. Pretty fantastic uh, documentary about the history of this eruption and ask your parents about it they might remember when this erupted because they were alive during this time period anyways have a great night have a great weekend and uh, we'll uh, do our first quiz on igneous and volcanoes next week